my friends, this is Magic Brad with The Magic Brad Show. Da, da, da. So today is Wednesday. It's Good Friends Day. <laughs> and we've got my friend from over in the eastern part of the United States. Her name is Deb Brown. And I'm going to bring her on in a bit here. But um, hope you're doing well. You know, we hope everybody's doing well. You know, the, the whole world's going through some craziness right now. But we hope everything's all wonderful and people are happy. Okay, so let's find her. Where is she? She is here. Deb's here. Hi, Deb. Hey, Brad. How are you? I am wonderful. You already knew that. Yes. Good <laughs> to see you again. It's all a matter of altitude or attitude or something like that. Got to yep. have attitude of gratitude. Attitude determines your altitude. Something like that. It does. I mean, it's interesting because you can make a choice. And you being a magician, it's all about perception. You know, you can kind of figure out whether something's good or bad. Yeah. And the upside is we're, I'm, I'm above the daisies, you know, I'm alive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so today, as you know, the Deb's got a book and the book is Sell Like Jesus. And it's a, yeah, there's a picture of the book right there and it's available on Amazon, correct? How much does the book sell for? It sells for $13.99 or Kindle is $9.99. Okay. So that's the non-physical version? Correct. Perfecto. Well, there you go. And the book basically is about using uh, Christian biblical principles to make sales, which is, I think it's relieving. It's probably, a, finally, I don't have a like a timeshare salesman trying to sell me a vacation home. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we've all had that negative experience with a high pressure salesman. Um, and today we're talking about the clothes which can be the point in the sale that feels like pressure. Sure. So we're going to start talking about it from the perspective of the golden rule. I don't know if everybody knows the golden rule came out of the Bible. It's Matthew 7, 12. And here's what it says in the NIV version. So to, in everything you do, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So do unto others as you would have them do to you. If you don't like it done to you, don't do it to anybody else. Excellent. <laughs> With that as a framework, I think something happens when people get into a sales role. They feel like they have to turn into that weird, slimy pressure guy and are somehow responsible to make people buy from them. And it just doesn't work. And I I don't know anybody who likes that. Well, I think some people, when they, they think about the sales thing, they, they look at it as one person is losing, they're losing their money, and the other person is gaining the money. But you got to bring the product into place where another person might be gaining the product and the other person is losing the product. So it's really an, an equal exchange, I think. It's important to be... Yeah. Honestly, yeah, that's what we have to go for is that equal exchange. It has to be good for both parties. So fair exchange of goods or services in return for compensation. And people have to feel like what they're paying is worth what they're getting. So we talked the last time about the importance of building relationships and really in a sales relationship, the conversation evolves around the buyer's needs and the potential solution. So it's a very focused conversation, but it's always designed to help the buyer realize for themselves, because sometimes they don't even know the full depth of their need until they have somebody who cares enough to ask some questions to help them really think through why am I looking for this? And what do I really need it to do? And if I had a wish list, what would I put in that wish list? And does that even exist? I may not know whether it does or not. So when you get to the close, it's really about helping the person move forward in the decision-making process. I, I don't know about you, but I don't think there are very many sales where it's, I see it, I buy it, I'm done. I think 
there's always some kind of multiple touches. I used to hear it was seven to 13 touches before someone bought. And some of those could be conversations, some of them could be ads or somebody else talked about the product. Now you were mentioning another statistics now statistic that has to do with I just heard that it's a lot more because nowadays there's so many other platforms. Like I could just get to know you here on this video, but then I might not see you on Periscope or LinkedIn or Pinterest. I might not see you out there. So I might have might be a week or something before I came back to the YouTube platform to be able to see you again. Right. So that's why I might be might be looking around all over the place and there's other distractions that diffuse the, um, um, what would I say, the, um, the the caliber of the introduction. You know, some people walk into a room and they make a big impression. Others, it's kind of like, mm, so you need a lot more of those little ones. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, that's why. And some of it has to do with timing. Some of it has to do with urgency. The point is that rarely is someone going to say, yes, I'll buy immediately. So there are a series of steps that the buyer walks through either with you or on their own or a combination of both in order to come to the place where they feel comfortable saying, yes, I'll spend money on this. So as the salesperson, it's important for us to help walk that person down that trail step by step. So this conversation, somebody viewing this video, for example, this is a step in their decision decision making process about investing in sales training or a book or whatever it might be. So my hope is to move them to the next step through this encounter. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a series of small steps. It's not anything big. And I like to use the nature analogy when, you know, when, when you're growing a plant, it doesn't like that. Right. It slowly kind of yeah. gradually gets to blossom and then you got the fruit and it just takes time. Yeah. And I had another thought and I was trying to, because the abruptness, the, the do unto others as you'd expect them to do unto you kind of thing mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if you're the salesperson, you're thinking, okay, I need to get to close this sale because this is a big commission. Mm -hmm. The recipient, the person that's buying, that's not what's in their head. That I just can't wait to get rid of this money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so when I work with people, I actually advocate to shift mindset. So instead of thinking, I have to make this sale, think, I have to do everything I can to help this person make a good decision. Mm -hmm. That's a whole lot different than I have to get their money. Totally. I have to make this sale. Because it's really not about the money because the money is just an, a currency or an exchange of energy. And then it's just a matter of the product moving from one spot yeah. to the other. <laughs> yes. It, if I'm focused on me and my needs, then that is going to leak out as pressure. Sure. If I'm focused on you and your needs, then I'm in my head is in the right place to do what's best for you. And when I put your needs first, my needs end up getting taken care of by the very nature of the fact that I put you first. That is a kingdom principle that's upside down to the way the world thinks. Sure. We usually think, you know, if we don't look out for ourselves, nobody's going to look out for us. If I don't ask for the sale, I'm not going to get it. There yeah. are partial truths, you know, and that's the problem with both those statements. They are partially true. They also encompass a damaging perspective. And when I say damaging, it, it damages the relationship. Every time I'm self-focused, I'm not thinking about the other. Yeah, it's like the the high pressure salesperson with the uh, you know the sale ends on whatever the fear of missing out strategy and things. Yeah. That's irritating to me because if you, if whatever you have is good, it's going to be good next week too. It should stand alone. It it doesn't need uh, you know the price goes up on Monday close, <laughs> right and. There are some businesses that still teach one call close. Um, wow. 
And in those cases, it is very true that if you walk out the door, the chances of getting the sale are much less likely. But I, I maintain that the main reason they are less likely is because those people don't have a follow through mentality. They don't have that step by step mentality. They're thinking once and done, and if I don't get it, it's gone. So they don't follow up. They don't follow through. They don't go back and ask, now that you've thought about it, what are you thinking? <laughs> because it just isn't even part of their mindset. You've already um, educated Elizabeth here. She was kind of wondering where the golden rule came from. Excellent. Glad to help with that. Yeah. Matthew seven twelve for those who didn't tune in earlier. So that's all. So I remember seeing a guy that um, he used to do um, timeshare sales, and he taught timeshare sales. And it's very, in my opinion, neuro linguistic program manipulative, where you find the person and then you find the problem. You basically amplify the problem, and then you show them the solution. And I think that's really kind of cruel that you put a person in such an emotional distress that they almost feel obligated to make the purchase. Well, and not only are you putting them in distress, you're also setting up your pitch to basically say, if you don't buy this, you're stupid. Yeah, that's what I mean. And that's not do unto others as you'd want to be done. Exactly. So um, instead, honoring that people are vulnerable they are emotional, they have a need, they have a gap they're trying to fill, they have a goal they're trying to reach. So they're feeling the pressure of that. And it's true and it needs to be talked about in order to evolve the conversation to the right solution. But here's what the high pressure salesman does. He takes advantage of that emotion to get them to buy on emotion. Right. And afterwards, when they get out of the immediate pressure zone, people often back out of those sales. The buyer's remorse thing. Because the other piece of making a purchase is being able to justify it intellectually. So, mm -hmm. It's true to be said that we make the buying decision at an emotional level, but we have to rationalize it intellectually. And a good professional salesperson will walk you through that process of rationalization, pointing out now there is a cost to this. Have you considered what the budget is? Have you considered where, how you're going to pay for it? Um, and decision, making the decision, you know, you probably haven't ever thought of this. We actually go through a process to decide, but we don't map it out, write it out, articulate it typically. We just do it automatically. So again, the professional salesperson is going to say, what process do you go through to make a decision about purchasing something like this? And who besides yourself needs to be involved in this decision? Mm -hmm. And what's the time frame that you're trying to get this accomplished? Because who, who besides you, time frame, ability to pay for it, these are all pieces of being able to make the purchase and make it comfortably, make it at a conscious level. Yes, I'm going to spend this money because I believe I'm getting the value for it and I'm able to do it at this time, period. That's where you want the buyer to be. You want them to be at that place that they can have confidence. I'm making a good decision here. And the, the, the approach that you're teaching also, I see how it, there, the next sale will be much easier because they feel comfortable yes. in buying from that person. So this is really valid in like the real estate industry. If you're going to sell somebody multiple houses or like insurance, you've got someone that's going to really take care of you. And then the referral element too, right? I was going to say, even if the individual isn't likely, if it's not a, a frequent repurchase kind of item, it's the referral network. 
when you do a good job for someone, when you treat them with dignity, when you treat them with respect, they love you for it. And they will tell their friends about you and the experience they had. Because quite honestly, Brad, really good sales experiences are few and far between. And when you have a good one, you want to be able to share it with people that you know. So you're definitely not an advocate of that ABC. You remember that? That always be closing. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that what goes along with that is always be collecting yeses. Get the prospect to say yes. Every time they say yes, they're more likely to say yes to the sale. <laughs> I say no to that. <laughs> yeah, it makes it so much more sense, uh, especially in these times when a person it's very possible when you're trying to sell something, they've already researched it and they kind of know all about it. So you better be a good person. Otherwise, you're not going to make that purchase. They'll go somewhere yeah. else because it's easy just to pivot and go find it somewhere else. Yeah, that is so true. These days, people can research you and your products and services so much more than they ever could before. There are online reviews. There's your website. There are videos that you're posting. So lots of ways for people to form an opinion even before they talk to you. And if they're talking to you, it's because they couldn't get all their answers through other avenues. I find today people will avoid conversation. I think it's a dying art. Oh, it is. So I, I always advocate to anyone who's in sales, don't be so quick to take the easy way out of just doing things electronically. Yes, it can work. And there's also a lot to be said for having a dialogue that's real time, where you can ask questions about what the person just said, or you can hear the tone of voice yep. and maybe pick up on that and ask something based on tone of voice. You just don't get that through electronic print. Well, that's why I like the video, like what we're doing now. And also you see a lot of people when they respond to things on you know, with messaging and things, they're usually like one or two word replies. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine that in a real conversation? It's uh, it'd be like one person talking, the other person going, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really, really strange. I, I find, I mean, this is sort of a side thing, but I'm talking with somebody on Messenger and then I say, hey, you want to get on the phone? And they go, I don't have time. <laughs> Well, what are you doing on the internet for? <laughs> what they didn't say is they're in a meeting and they shouldn't really be on their phone right now, so they can't answer. <laughs> and and look at that, just right there. Their attention is divided. Yeah. So you're not having the quality conversation that you can have doing what we're doing here. And that history that if you, if you respond to someone in their short little snippets, is that they kind of think that, well, if we do meet, is that how I'm going to be treated? So you kind of lost the sale already there. It it can undermine trust and you don't even know it. Yeah. So that definitely falls into the do on to others. So electronic is not all bad. It's good for uh, recording facts, for sharing links, for recapping conversations, for recapping uh, deliverables. You said you were going to do this. I'm going to do that. We're going to reconvene at X. The, the electronic communication is excellent for all of that. What it isn't helpful for is problem solving. Good. Elab elaborate on that. <laughs> Selling is about solving problems. It's helping people figure out what the best solution is for whatever the gap is that they're experiencing. So at, at, the, at a generic level, regardless of product or service, tangible or intangible, everyone is looking, they're at a certain place, they're at point A and they need to get to point B. And there is a gap between point A and point B. And they have probably tried Gap, some ways to get over that gap mm -hmm. and they haven't worked. So they're left with, I've still got this gap. I got to get it fixed. So I'm looking for a new solution. 
that's why they want to engage with you in conversation because they their best thinking got them to point a and it hasn't been able to get them to point b so if you can come along and serve as a valued advisor someone who reflects well i hear you saying this and tell me more about that and and ask the history what have you tried what's worked in the past what hasn't worked and get the person thinking at that deeper analytical level, you actually help that person figure out what they need, what they want, and how ultimately how important it is to them because we only spend money on what we think is important. Right. And when I respect that you're the buyer, which makes you the decision maker, I'm just a decision getter, decision gatherer. It's my job to help you come to a conclusion, but it's not my job to dictate that that conclusion is yes. Right. Because you're the only one who can decide that. That, where that really helps the buyer's remorse thing because they made the decision. It was their hunter. So they're responsible for making yeah. their own decision. That takes all the pressure off both parties because honestly, I don't want to be responsible for selling you something that turns out to be the wrong thing. I, I don't oh, it costs a lot of money to put it back on the shelf. <laughs> it, the headache of returns, the headache of bad press. When people say, Oh, this person don't go to that. I, I don't need to buy travel. that travels like wildfire that the bad news flies all over the place. If people are happy with you, they tell one or two. If they're upset, they tell 14 to 20. So we're at 21 minutes and 55 seconds. Let us see your book again. You got to copy your book up there because that's what we're all talking about. The book is called Sell Like Jesus, available on Amazon. I forgot to put these little things up here. I want to do that too because I've got the, this is how you get a hold of the book. SellLikeJesus.com. It's the same as the title. That's easy to remember. And then if you want to connect with Deb, you can just go to debbrownsales.com. I love your domain names because they're so simple. Yay. <laughs> debbrownsales.com if you're looking for some help with your sales team. And then there's the book if you don't want to talk to Deb, you want to just read her information. There you go. But I suggest that you talk to Deb. <laughs> Yes, and, and I've mentioned before, and I'll make the offer here, I will talk with anybody at, at no charge just to, if there's any way I can help you get clarity on direction that you want to take, I'm more than happy to do that. The first half hour is completely free. So don't hesitate to get on my calendar. There's actually a calendar link if you click schedule some time. Okay, we got this right here. This is what we've been doing at Sell Like Jesus. This has been a three-part series. The first part was about generating leads. The second was about relationships. And this final one here is about closing that sale and doing on to others as you would expect to be done to you. I think that's a wise way to do it. And uh, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we part? Uh, just a reminder that you do not have to pressure people when you know how to ask the right questions to help them decide for themselves if your product or service is good for them. Perfecto. Well, Deb, I'm gonna pop you into the green room here and then we can have Thank a conversation. Thank you, Brad. Really appreciate the much. time with you. And I'll beam this up to the internet. Nice round of applause for Deb Brown. Thank you, Thank Deb. You. Well, there we go. That was kind of fun, wasn't it? I think it's really important that uh, these days, because like I say, in the internet, it's all open. So if, uh, you know, if you're mean to people uh, as your part-time thing, and then you try and be nice on the sales floor, um, someone's going to find out. So be nice. <laughs> I will say it when I finish my videos. Be nice, be kind, be good, be peaceful. So peace, love, and happiness. This is Magic Brad signing off. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be well. See ya. Bye.